Hello, doctors in Sussex say they can no longer guarantee patients will be safe in their hospitals. NHS Sussex is in an unprecedented fourth consecutive day of a critical incident, meaning the health service is struggling to provide safe care. Declaring a critical incident allows the NHS to take additional steps to try and maintain patient safety while managing the significant pressure the system is under. Our health correspondent Mark Norman reports. Intolerable and unsustainable is how doctors are describing the situation facing the NHS. From GPs to ambulance response times, from horrendous waits in A&E to a social care system described as gridlocked. Over the holiday period, tens of thousands of people have called the ambulance service on 999 or attended A&E. Both Nikki and her elderly father, who she cares for, spent five hours on the floor of their bathroom after they both slipped and fell only to be told by the ambulance crew there was no point going to A&E. And, and then they explained to us that, really, that the waiting time at the William Harvey that they'd never known before was about 62 hours to be seen. So on that point, Dad decided he wouldn't, he wouldn't go. While others who did go to A&E found the experience traumatic. I mean, we were six of us in, a, in a, what was a treatment area bay the drip stands were being shared, so you couldn't just go to the loo. There was no means of summoning a nurse, no bells, no, no nothing. One man sat in his own urine for more than 24 hours. I mean, the floor was soaking. And as the health service across Sussex enters this unprecedented fourth day of a declared critical incident, doctors at the county's largest A&E department agree to tell us anonymously how bad things have become. We are getting to a stage where safety, patient safety, is at risk on a daily basis and we can no longer guarantee it. We haven't got the space and the means to treat patients. We have an area called the corridor area, which is where we hold patients who are waiting to be admitted or waiting to be seen. Usually the space extends to about 15 to 20 patients. At the moment, we're doubling up that easily with about 38 to 40 patients, which means patients are lined up behind, in front, wherever there's space, by the fire exit. It obviously causes anxiety to public when they hear that clinicians are raising those concerns. My clinicians are talking to me, my executive team and my hospital leadership teams every day. Uh, today, I've been present in the emergency department to talk to colleagues and actually a reflection on, on how things feel a little bit better today because we've taken quite a lot of action to support patients. Both East Kent Hospitals and University Hospital Sussex told us today they're seeing unprecedented demands on their emergency department and staff are working tirelessly, but reiterated the public can do their bit by only attending A&E if they have an immediate life-threatening need. Well, Mark joins me now. Mark, how worried should people be about accessing healthcare right now? Well, you listen to some of that and you're going to be worried, aren't you? And let's face it, this no one wants to be here. Senior NHS managers, frontline NHS staff, and certainly us, the patients, don't want to see the NHS in this state. But clearly, they're struggling. So we've had a lot of emails about the situation that reflect that. Leslie sent us one, for example, talking about her experience in Brighton, seeing people on trolleys, too deep in corridors with no pain relief, no help on hand. It really reiterates some of what we just heard. And I think when you get those basic care needs wrong, you know, no pain relief and no help, that's what really begins to upset and worry people. But there is a slightly different side, I suppose, despite things being busy. We had an email from Sarah who had an experience in A&E at Maidstone Hospital. She talked about being seen by overworked doctors and the doctors telling them there were still 80 patients to see after they'd seen her. But she also talks about the professional care. And I think most of us understand just how busy things are, but we want to see those basics done right. And when that's not done, that's really quite upsetting for many, many people. Things in the NHS seem so unrelentingly bleak at the moment, don't they? Is there any light at the end of this tunnel? Gosh. Gosh, that's almost a political answer to that somewhere, isn't there? I noticed tonight Steve Barclay, the health secretary in government, blaming the current situation on flu, strep A and COVID. But I think that's probably horribly oversimplifying it. That's added to the pressure, but it's not the only reason we're here. And many doctors will be screaming at the TV saying that's not the reason. When you speak to the chief executive that I spoke to earlier, he said things might be slightly improving today. They're beginning to discharge people, but that's also they're beginning to postpone some operations, which is clearly, you know, difficult for people, and they're apologising for that. That's happened right across the system in the last few days. I think one perhaps glimmer of light, the whole system now sits around a table, everything from councils and social care to GPs to hospital A&Es. 
and they all take a level of responsibility for what's happening. If they can get that bit right, sitting around the table, that would be good news. But let's face it, if there was a simple solution, someone would have found it already, Ellie. Indeed, Mark, as ever, thank you.